Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is going to be my ultimate guide to employing Fox 1, in other words, semi-active radar homing missiles in DCS world. My particular video is going to be focused on the MiG-29 and I will be going over some of the nuances and details of employing such missiles, such as the R-27 and the R-27ER. However, a lot of the tactics and things described within this video will be very applicable to any aircraft in DCS world that carries Fox 1 missiles. Now, the reason for making this video is because I generally found there's a little bit of a lack of consumable and easy content for Fox 1 BVR engagements on YouTube. I think that most videos can be split into either very dry, very mathematical and theoretical based, uh, which are a little bit difficult to consume, especially for those of us who just want something tangible that we can just employ uh, relatively quickly and easily in DCS world. And then there's content which is extremely simplified and overlook some of the really important features, tactics, and perhaps other things that build situational awareness in a Fox 1 fight, I thought I would try and create a more comprehensive but a consumable guide as to employing Fox 1 missiles in DCS world. <music> First, a quick disclaimer. I do not claim to be some sort of guru when it comes to BVR fights. However, I do feel like I've learned a fair amount practicing Fox 1 BVR engagements in recent times, and therefore I feel like I'm well positioned to provide you my two pence. Now, if you do think that something I have said isn't quite true or perhaps is very nuanced when it comes to DCS versus reality, please feel free to comment down below and I will take all of that on board. If you want to see and watch somebody who is extremely competent and understands a lot about the technicalities and some of the theory behind Fox 1 BVR engagements, then I really suggest that you watch Fly and Wire. Also, this video will be fairly long, so if you want to skip ahead and if you don't want to hear me talk about some of the basics, then feel free to use the time codes below and skip to the section that you want. In case you're an absolute beginner in DCS world, FOX1, FOX2 and FOX3 are simply brevity codes used by NATO forces to describe a certain type of missile. FOX1, semi-active radar homing missiles, which is what we are looking at today, are missiles which rely upon the launch aircraft guiding the missile all the way to its target using its radar. In other words, if at any point during the missile's flight the launch aircraft loses its radar lock, the missile will go dumb and never reach its target. Fox 1 missiles have been around from the Vietnam era until the present day, and within the realms of DCS world, all Red 4 jets apart from the Chinese J-11 rely on semi-active radar homing missiles, the Fox 1 missiles, for their BVR capability. And in most cases, if you're flying fourth generation fighters such as the Su-27, MiG-29, or Su-33, you will have to learn how to employ the R-27 and its derivatives. A slight caveat to what I have just said is the fact that the Soviet R-27 missile also comes in FOX-2 form. Those are IR heat seekers. And the R-27 is unusual in the fact that it is a BVR medium range missile, but can come in both a radar guided and a heat seeker version as well. Although in theory, both the IR and the radar guided versions of the R-27 could have similar launch parameters, in practice, the IR version of the missile needs to acquire an IR lock with its heat seeker inside the missile, as well as the aircraft's radar getting a lock onto an enemy. This means that the R-27R is far less limited in terms of its launch parameters, as it does not rely on a heat source from a target. The advantage of the R-27T and ET versions is, of course, the fact that they are fire and forget weapons. So if you are attacking a target from a rear aspect where the heat source and the heat signature of the target is much greater, that is probably the time to employ the R-27T. Now, in this particular video, we are going to be focusing on the R-27R, the radar-guided version of the missile, which for most medium-range BVR scenarios is the missile of choice. The US and NATO equivalent of the R-27 semi-active radar homing missile would be the AIM-7 Sparrow. This was actively used by NATO forces all the way up until the 90s when it was replaced by the AIM-120 AMRAAM, which is a FOX-3 missile for BVR combat. FOX-3 missiles are active radar homing missiles, which means the launch aircraft does not need to maintain its radar lock all the way until impact 
for the missile to hit its target. In fact, at a certain stage, the launch aircraft is able to turn cold and the missile will still proceed on its trajectory to hit its target using its own internal radar. And for this reason, Fox 3 missiles are far more capable in a BVR environment than Fox 1 missiles. And there is no one set tactic that a Fox 1 fighter can employ against a Fox 3 fighter to offset the advantage of the Fox 3 missile. The first thing we need to accept in Fox 1 BVR fights is that if you are going to be as committed as your enemy, provided both aircraft are of similar capability, at shooting each other down, you're always going to be taking a big risk. Unlike Fox 3 fights where an aircraft is able to turn cold and flow cold out of harm's way, whilst its missile is guiding itself using its own onboard radar, in Fox 1 fights, this is simply not possible. And the relative closure rates of both aircraft, especially at very high speed, could be such that both aircraft will end up merging very easily unless the Fox 1 missiles impact their target. A decision to flow cold will often put you in a very disadvantageous position, especially with a lack of data link in aircraft such as the MiG-29. Therefore, this will have to be made either very early on in the engagement or taking other factors into account which are very specific to that mission and friendly units in the area. The kinematic performance of any missile will depend on two main factors. The velocity at which it leaves the rail on the wing of the aircraft and also the density altitude. In other words, the higher and faster your launching missile, the better. Due to a big spike in aerodynamic drag in the transonic region, it is crucial to be launching your missiles above Mach 1 if at all possible. It is also possible to loft your missiles into lesser dense air and thereby increasing their performance. Now there's a lot of debate whether or not this was actually a tactic used by real pilots. However, it is important to note that some versions of the AIM-7 Sparrow missile have the lofting feature which would loft the missile after it leaves the aircraft. Therefore, it is very plausible that a pilot manually lofting a missile which does not have an auto loft feature should yield similar results. Now let's look at a basic, somewhat simplified timeline for a basic BVR engagement against an offensive enemy fighter group. Once committed, lead will dictate the sort order for himself and the wingman based on the radar picture. Both aircraft within the element have to target separate aircraft. Obviously, in case of an AI wingman, this is not possible. Ideally, both aircraft need to be in a line of rest formation to maximize their weapons potential. Next, the element will either proceed for a head-on missile shot, followed by a crank, or an initial crank followed by a recommit for a shot. The exact tactic will depend on many factors, not least of which is the launch platform in question and the amount of Fox 1 missiles available. In the case of the MiG-29-912, which only carries two medium range Fox 1 missiles, posturing shots at long ranges against highly maneuverable targets often don't result in any meaningful results, as a simple crank from the Bandit will be enough to defeat your missile. In order to increase the chances of a successful hit, a shot must be made much closer to or within the missile's no escape zone. Depending on the jamming capability of the enemy fighters, it may be difficult to initiate a crank early, as the element will have to burn through the enemy's jammers before being able to sort, decide on a game plan, and crank. Cranking means offsetting your flight path relative to the target whilst maintaining a radar lock. As we know, the maximum, minimum, and no escape ranges for a missile depend on the closure rate between you and the target. Offsetting your flight path with a crank will reduce the closure rate and therefore reduce the missile's effective range, both for you and the bandit you are targeting. This has a two-fold effect. It slows down the timeline, providing you extra thinking time and allows you to reduce the distance between you and the enemy bandit for an effective shot. This is because once you recommit nose hot on the enemy, your closure rate will instantly increase and as a result, your missile's no escape range will increase, giving you an opportunity to take a shot with a much higher probability of kill. Another benefit of a crank is that any missile shot by a bandit will have to lead your aircraft. As soon as you recommit on the bandit or reverse the crank, that missile will have to change its trajectory significantly, leading its energy. Therefore, cranking is an effective defensive maneuver whilst maintaining an offensive posture and being able to guide your own missile to the target. As mentioned earlier, being committed to guiding your Fox 1 missile all the way to impact with the sort of missile performance and characteristics that we have in DCS world will always result in somewhat of a gamble, and we're effectively excluding the possibility of flowing cold to reset if we're committed to getting the kill, especially once we're within the MAR or the minimum abort range of the enemy's missile. In an ideal world, 
you should know the MAR of the enemy's missile in order to determine the range at which a safe abort is possible. Though the MAR, of course, is a dynamic number and will depend on the speed, altitude, closure rate between aircraft. As a significant simplification, if we take the AIM-7 and the R-27R as having broadly comparable performance, you can use the no escape zone of your own missile as a broad indicator as to when you no longer have the ability to turn and run. Broadly speaking, once the bandit is within the no escape range, the MAR of your missile, you are fully committed. Although this has to be taken with a pinch of salt if you're up against longer range missiles such as the AIM-54 and R-33. Therefore, as a crude simplification, but one that allows us to employ the tactic in most scenarios, we can say that a good time to recommit onto the target after a crank has been initiated is broadly speaking when your target is approaching the maximum range of your missile during the crank. By the time you recommit nose hot onto the target, the closure rate will have increased between the two aircraft and therefore the maximum launch range of the missile as well as the nose cape range will have increased, putting your target somewhere broadly speaking between maximum launch and the nose cape zone. Now this is obviously a crude simplification and will not work for every type of missile against every type of enemy and therefore knowing who you're up against is very important. But broadly speaking, if we're comparing the R-27 and the AIM-7, which is the most likely scenario for fourth generation fighters in DCS world, is a good starting point. Now, in my personal testing, at least against a similar opponent such as the F-15 armed with AIM-7 Sparrows, I have found that getting the first launch is important. Whoever launches first often wins the fight. Although you may be launching your missiles outside the no escape zone or the MAR, they can still be extremely effective and deadly, and it may be very difficult to defeat these missiles simply by cranking and dragging them into lower atmosphere, whilst also maintaining a radar lock within the gimbal limits of your radar to guide your own missile. This is why, as I've mentioned previously, FOX-1 fights can be a real gamble, and getting that first shot can make all the difference between life and death. So now you have most likely shot your FOX-1 missile whilst pulling your nose onto the target in a level turn. You are now fully committed to the fight and there is no going back. At this point, irrespective of whether the enemy has fired or not, continuing the crank in the opposite direction would be prudent as it will make it harder for the enemy's missile to get you by once again having to lead and fly a longer distance. If the enemy has fired a FOX-1 missile by this point, it's not going to be possible to defeat it with simply a steady crank. Therefore, reversing the crank again or weaving whilst also descending rapidly to drag the enemy's missile to thicker air, whilst of course maintaining a radar lock and cranking within your radar's gimbal limits is the best way to go. If chaff is available, now is a very good time to use it. By this point, if you are still alive and the bandit is still alive, you will have no choice but to pick him out visually and transition to a heat-seeking FOX-2 missile. Make sure that you use flares preemptively as you get close as there's a chance the bandit will have seen and launched a close-range FOX-2 missile before you've noticed it. If at any point during the timeline you notice that the bandit has changed his vector significantly to flow cold or flank and your RWR is no longer providing any indications of a missile launch, Provided you know that the bandit is not armed with FOX-3 missiles, it can be assumed that the bandit is on the defensive and will no longer be able to guide any of his FOX-1 missiles due to breaking the radar gimbal limits. In this situation, it is safe to turn your nose onto the bandit and pursue him. 